It's one of the most famous and mysterious faces in history. A teenage pharaoh who ruled over ancient Egypt. Tutankhamun. But who was Tutankhamun? How did he live? And most intriguingly, how did he die? She! For decades, there have been many competing theories about how Tut died. A chariot accident, a mysterious illness, even murder. Now, we're getting closer to solving this mystery. To find out how he died, we're going back in time. Oh, look at the eyes! <gasps> the eyes have all been painted. Using 21st century science, we'll be carrying out a virtual post-mortem on the pharaoh's body. It's just, it's just mind-blowing, the views that you get. And looking at conclusive DNA evidence to expose a shocking family secret. Fits together, I said, oh my God, this cannot be true. We found it, we've got it finally. For the first time, we'll reconstruct the entire body of the boy king and reveal a revolutionary new theory of what really killed Tutankhamun. Investigation begins here, on the edge of the blistering Sahara, in one of ancient Egypt's most sacred places. Here we are. This is it. I've got to say, it's actually quite ordinary and anonymous looking. If you didn't actually know where you are, you'd probably just drive straight past it. It's not like pulling up next to the pyramids. Could be any valley in Egypt really, but this particular valley just happens to be one of the most important sites in all of Egyptian history. It's the final resting place of the great pharaohs. Today, we know it simply as the Valley of the Kings. Up here, you get a wonderful sense of the valley. So you look down it and you can see how all the, the different tombs are laid out. But you also get a terrific sense of the physical geography of the valley. So behind me, you've got these wonderful cliffs that form a, a natural barrier. Looking down the valley, there's a small opening. Would have been very small back in the day down there. So the whole place would be like a, a giant cul-de-sac, very protected. The Egyptians started to bury their rulers here around 1500 BC. Before that, they'd been buried in pyramids. And they chose this protected valley because they assumed it would be safe from the tomb raiders who'd broken into the pyramids. And just over there, above the cliffs, there's a, a natural pyramid which would have been worshipped by the ancient Egyptians. That pyramid was a goddess called Merisaga, which means she who loves silence. She would have liked it here. Over the centuries, thieves managed to raid all of the tombs in this valley, except one, this one. In 
In 1922, the tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered here by archaeologist Howard Carter. Inside was a breathtaking treasure trove that made the name Tutankhamun known across the world. Given that he's so globally famous now, we actually know remarkably little about Tut's life. And that's partly because his reign was cut short when he was around about the age of 19. But it's his cause of death that's become one of Egypt's most enduring mysteries. To see why his death is such a mystery, I'm heading for his tomb with Egyptologist Gail Gibson. They would have had to dig all this out. Every bit of it, wondering every minute, what was at the end? From the moment Howard Carter entered this place, there were signs that there was something strange about Tut's death. Why give him this? For a start, when compared to the other tombs in the valley, this one was a lot smaller. It is surprisingly small. It's not at all what you'd expect for royalty. No. It is very strange, this very bare and small tomb. This was the room with the chariots and beds and boxes and all kinds of stuff. This modest tomb was jammed full of all the royal possessions that were usually buried with a king. It can't have been meant to be all jumbled up like that. People are just trying to cram as much stuff as possible into this small space. Shall we go down? Yeah, let's... <gasps> I can't believe we're going to do this. Another unusual thing is the decoration, or rather, lack of it. Other royal tombs are adorned in hundreds of intricate portraits of the pharaohs and the gods. By comparison, this one just doesn't look very royal. And the paintings here are interesting. Everything is on a very large scale. Very mysterious. These are, these are odd paintings for a king. And lastly, on top of the paintings, something that's only recently been identified. 3,000-year-old mold. It looks like these paintings were done on wet plaster, very fast, painted on, and then bang, bring in everything, close up the tomb very quickly. But this is still wet, and so the mold has a chance to grow, even though there's nobody here for the next 3,000 years. So it kind of does suggest yeah. a hurried burial, perhaps. You know, caution, wet paint, never mind, we'll just seal it up yeah. anyway. I think that's one of the best bits of evidence, yeah. that it's a rush burial. And in another corner, still resting in his tomb, is the mummified body of Tutankhamun himself. Poor Tut's mummy's in pretty bad shape. It was sawn in half and the head's come off and bits are missing and it's, it's not great, really. But the reality is this. It's actually just a, uh, a young man cut down in his prime. We know that Tut was around 19 when he died, a surprisingly young age. That, together with the unusual burial, suggests it was not a natural death. So, we've got a, a small tomb, an apparent hurried burial, his age, the type of art that you see here. They're all factors that seem to point to a sudden and unexpected death. And for many years, for many people, the most tantalising explanation was foul play. Had the young pharaoh been murdered? If he was murdered, then there must have been a motive. To try and find one, I'm leaving the bustling city behind. 
Come on, let me see you do a dive. Hi. Okay. <laughs> I'm heading 200 miles down the sacred River Nile to a remarkable place, Armana. The murder theory gathered pace in 1968 when for the very first time, Scientists x-rayed Tut's mummy. I've got an actual x-ray of, of Tut's head, which got people excited. And here you can see these intracranial bone fragments just there, that white spot. Little bits of broken bone inside the head. These things were interpreted as possible evidence for a blow to the head. Why would anyone assassinate a pharaoh? They were the ultimate political and religious leaders of the country, but much more than that. Pharaohs were seen as living gods, so the idea of murdering one is even more extreme than killing a, a mere mortal. And actually, throughout Egyptian history, we see very, very few examples of pharaohs being bumped off. So to murder Tutankhamun, someone must have had a very strong motive. I've arrived at Armana. This city was built by Tut's predecessor, the rebel pharaoh Akhenaten. The clues to the murder plot lie hidden in these remains. And it all hinges on Akhenaten's obsession with one god, the sun disk, the Aten. Akhenaten worships the Aten as the supreme god, the giver and creator of life, and he did it right here. Records show that Akhenaten even had religious visions, so powerful that he built this entire city in the desert and made it the new capital. It ran for about six miles along the Nile. There were rich palaces and lavish homes, and at its heart, a vast temple to the sun god, the Aten. But what the pharaoh had done here was more than build a new city. He'd created a new religion, with the Aten as the supreme god. And this radical change made him enemies. When Akhenaten died, the young Tutankhamun inherited a country in chaos and many powerful enemies. He'd only been around about nine years old, this nine-year-old kid in charge of the whole show in one of Egypt's most turbulent periods. The murder theory suggests that when Tut reached maturity, his advisors, fearing for a loss of their own power, or perhaps wary of a return to the previous regime, had him killed. It does seem to fit with the evidence. 
a sudden death, a blow to the head, and a convincing political motive for murder. But now, new scientific evidence is challenging this. I'm about to attend an autopsy, a virtual autopsy, on Tut's 3,000-year-old body. Shall we bring up our subjects? Oh, okay. Have a the, 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 our great truth. king, yes, sure. Here he is. Here he is. We've been given exceptionally rare access to nearly 2,000 CT scans of Tut's mummified remains. <laughs> it's just, it's just mind-blowing, the views that you get. CT, you can get three-dimensional image, bones and soft tissues. This is unique. This is the main difference between an X-ray and a CT scan. Radiologist Professor Ashraf Salim is about to conduct a virtual post-mortem of King Tutankhamun. Just to start with the beginning here, that we can see that the mummy is in a, in a very bad state. The whole body is cut into pieces. Hundreds of fractures, probably when they tried to remove the heavy golden mask that was stuck to the chest and the abdomen of King Tut, and was stuck with a, like a glue. As we begin, there's a key question I want answered. Was Tut murdered by a blow to the back of the head? So much of the discussion has been about the skull, is that somehow Tut was killed or murdered by a blow to the, to the back yeah. of the head. Yeah, because of these bone fragments. Where did, I mean, if you can see with me now, this is the skull. We're going into it. These bone fragments lying loose within the skull cavity. It's a crucial finding. If the fragments had come from a fatal blow to Tut's head, they would have been stuck in the embalming resin poured into his skull when he was mummified. The fact that they're not stuck in the resin means one thing. Meaning what? Meaning that these bone fragments got inside after mummification. That's why they're loose. So we can say, without a shadow of a doubt, that Tut wasn't murdered by a blow to the back of the head, as has been sure. suggested. Sure, 100%. That's, 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 that's we've killed that. that. Yeah, and okay. that should close this issue for good. The CT solved the mystery. Completely? Completely, with no doubts. Okay. He was not murdered by a blow to the head. Okay. So if it wasn't murder, then what killed him? This is the whole mummy in front of us on the big screen. Our virtual autopsy has further clues. All the bones are fractured. Most, if not all, 99% of the fractures were induced post-mortem. The CT scans reveal clear evidence that these bones were broken after Tut died. A huge amount of damage was done when the mummy was moved by Howard Carter. Are there any breaks that we can categorically say this happened before he died? It's only one site that we could say that. It's the knee. This is the fracture. So this is the fracture here, this black this area. This black here. area. It's a big trauma. I mean, like, if you think it about is. it, your femur is the biggest, it is. biggest it bone is. in your it body. It is a big trauma, not just fell down. No, yeah. no it's the big trauma. You, you see these dense white lines mm -hmm. there? This is the resin that coated the fracture edges. This fracture happened shortly before he died and before embalming. This fracture happened so close to the time of death it's almost certainly linked to what killed him.
Unfortunately for us, we have a unique window into the life of this pharaoh. The thousands of belongings, big and small, he was buried with. These are exact replicas of the objects found in Tut's tomb. They've been painstakingly recreated from the originals, and they've all been laid out exactly as they would have been when Carter found them. Because, like all pharaohs, Tut was considered a god, he was buried with the things he would need in the afterlife. These objects give us a picture of what really mattered to this young man. This is interesting. This is a dismantled chariot, or rather six chariots that were found in the tomb altogether, and obviously you had to dismantle them to be able to get them inside. Down here would have been leather webbing that you would have stood on, and you can see along here that's the shaft that would have attached to a pair of horses to drag you across the desert at high speed. In ancient Egypt, chariots were used for hunting or battle. And in Tut's tomb, there wasn't just one, there were six. So we know that there is only one injury that could be connected with Tut's demise, and it's this one, it's the, the fracture just above the left knee. But could a fall from a chariot whilst out hunting or in battle have caused that accident that led to his death? Knowing the exact nature of the injury, we can now try and find out what might have happened. Helping me is Professor Albert Zink, a world authority on ancient mummies, and Dr Richard Frampton, a crash injuries expert. It looks quite royal. I'm coming at this from the point of view of car crashes in the modern world. I mean, after all, this is the Egyptian sports car of the day. Yeah. Looking at this now, there's a great big chance here of being thrown from the chariot. It's very yeah. difficult. It looked very unstable. I think you need some good balance. Yeah. And it's... Certainly, it doesn't have a crash-worthiness structure at all. No. Like... How much force would you need to, to fracture just above yeah. the knee? The force to fracture a human femur is somewhere around about 10 kilonewtons, about the weight of a, a small European car. It's the strongest bone in the body. So what, what do you say for, so to make the horse go fast? She. She. She Allah. She Allah. So I just... Right. So can the like chariot this, this generate the same impact force as a modern car? This, here, like this? Yeah. I think the first thing we need to really establish is how fast these things can go. She. 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 Whoa. <laughs> Come on. She. She. Richard is measuring my top speed. She. She. And after a little bit of practice and some gentle horse whispering, Yeah, this is good, this is good. 10, 21, 21, 21. Great, you did it. Uh, yeah. Absolutely yeah. flying. How was that? 21 miles an hour. 21? Yeah. yeah. That's not bad. If I'd come off, and I didn't, thankfully. That kind of speed. Uh, coming off onto a hard surface, any type of bone fracture is possible, really. Among Egyptologists, a chariot accident is one of the more accepted theories of what killed Tutankhamun. 
But there's one thing that really struck me about riding that chariot. She! You're not just a passenger. This is a really physically demanding activity. It was great. It was a bit hairy at first, but then all your weight and all your balance is on your legs, and you have to use both your legs as if you were snowboarding or skateboarding. Yeah. So it's not a, an easy thing. And knowing that, I now want to have a closer look at Tut's physical abilities. And that means a closer look at the CT scans. You see here? Now, look at this. When you really examine his feet, you can see that the left foot is bent and twisted. Now, these bones, they're crowded, especially at the bases. So it's basically like these bits, if you like, are being sort of squished yes, together. Yes, exactly. The toes appear more or less divergent. They're sort of sticking out yeah. at a bit of an angle. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what would we call this in, in sort of layman's terms? Layman terms, we call it the clubfoot. The clubfoot, we can see it here. Let me have a look. A club foot is a bone deformity that would have caused Tut's foot to twist under his body. And what would that, that have meant for him? He would have had difficulty walking. Yes, I he walked with a limp. definitely he was limping at that time heavily. Right. But there are even more problems with his foot. Next, he developed a, a new disease while in the adolescent age, let's say starting from the age of 13, 14, what we call it Kohler's disease. Kohler's disease. Yes. And that's what's meaning it's necrosis of the bones. And necrosis means what? Well, means death, I mean, I suppose. Death, yeah. death of a small part of the bone. That's the area. Kohler's disease is a painful, disabling condition. The bones gradually collapse and can't support any weight. The end of this long bone, the metatars, is frayed and separated and becomes dense. And that's what we're having here. Separated, fragmented, unlike the other sound foot. You can see the joints intact. Mm -hmm. And this would have been incredibly painful. Yes, it is painful. OK, so we've got a congenital condition, yes. this, this club foot. We've got this Kohler's disease on top of that. I mean, it, it completely changes our whole picture of course. Of course. Time, so of course. This evidence taken together means that Tut would have struggled to walk. of course like to portray themselves as great warriors and heroic leaders but when you look closely at some of the smaller objects that were found in Tut's tomb there are clues to the real Pharaoh around about 130 canes like this all different shapes and sizes and some of them showed evidence of wear and tear it all adds to the evidence that here was somebody who was in pain, who struggled. It's a very, very different image to the boy king that we're familiar with. It casts a rather different light on the chariot accident theory as the cause of Tut's death. I've experienced how physically demanding it is to balance and steer a chariot. So how could Tut do it with his acutely painful condition? <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it with two legs, let alone one leg. Yeah, I think it's almost impossible. OK, so this condition on the foot, you reckon he would have been in a lot of pain and wouldn't actually have been able to put any pressure on it? Yeah. So the CT scans showed that he had a 
so-called curler syndrome. Yeah. It's an acute inflammation of the foot bones. So for me, it's very difficult to imagine that somebody with such a disease, with the acute form of the disease, steps on, on a chariot and even riding the chariot. So in my opinion, it's almost impossible that King Tut did ride the chariot and had an accident. So whatever caused Tut's injury, it seems unlikely it was done riding a chariot. The evidence provided by the CT scans have cast serious doubt on some of the more popular theories as to Tut's demise. But more than that, they've actually enabled us to meet him in person. Using forensic reconstruction techniques, we've recreated Tut's face and his entire body. This is the first ever accurate full-size image of him. This is the real pharaoh, the boy behind the golden mask. And the problem with his foot is the most important clue as to what might have killed him. The revelation of Tut's foot has opened up a new line of inquiry. It's a defect that can be genetic and could have been passed down by his family. I need to investigate Tut's family background. Until recently, all we had to go on was statues and written records and monuments. But actually, the Egyptians left something even more valuable. They left themselves. I'm travelling seven hours south of Cairo, deep into the Sahara Desert, to the Valley of the Golden Mummies. This is one of the places in Egypt where mummies still lie where they were buried. Creepers, this is a this is this is the stuff of nightmares right here. And you can make out their expression. Oh, look at the eyes! <gasps> the eyes have all been painted. Oh, look at this, you can actually see they've been gilded, they're gold. You can just see on the nose there, look. They've all been painted. The Egyptian technique of mummification aimed to preserve the entire body hair, skin, teeth, and bones for eternity. And recently, a new science has opened a door to the time of the pharaohs. You can make 40 minutes enough. It's now possible to extract and accurately analyze traces of ancient mummy DNA. But what makes it so difficult is that after 3,000 years, little DNA survives, and it's easily contaminated. So Professor Zink had to go deep into the bones to get his samples. And he extracted DNA from the most famous mummy of all.
I'm meeting up with him in the desert to hear about his results. The DNA has given us for the first time the chance to find out for certain who Tut's mum and dad were. Getting DNA out of ancient Egyptian mummies is almost impossible. In the beginning, it was, it was a mess. But when we managed to get this away to clean out the samples, we got really pure DNA to manage to tell something about him and especially about his ancestry. To untangle Tut's complex family tree, Albert analyzed DNA from 10 royal mummies suspected of being related to Tut. One was Akhenaten, the rebel pharaoh and Tut's predecessor. Of course, sons often succeed their father, but it certainly wasn't always the case. There was one idea that maybe the skeleton of Akhenaten was the father, but nobody had the proof for this. And the only way to find this out was to analyze the DNA. He began by analyzing the Y chromosome, which is only found in males, comparing Tut's with Akhenaten's, also known as KV55. We got from both mummies good results, and we could compare them. As you can see here, where they put the mouse here, you get this peak here, and this is for King Tut, yep. and you get the same peak here for Knarten. The match of the Y chromosome established there was a blood relationship between Tutankhamun and Akhenaten. But this only shows you whether they are paternally related. That means they could be also father and grandson, they could be father and cousin, father and brother. So we need to go to the next step and okay. make a complete genetic profile, a genetic, so-called genetic fingerprinting. Yeah, okay, so it's not just, it's not just the Y chromosome, it's, not it's just a whole the battery of different, t different Exactly. Tests. Okay. We compared the genetic fingerprint of King Tut and Kiwi 55. And in every one of these we have the same marker in King Tut and Kiwi 55. And these results clearly showed that they are father and son. Professor Zink had proved who Tut's dad was. It fits together. I said, oh my God, this cannot be true. We found it, we've got it finally. So there's no, there's no doubt, there's no debate anymore. There's no debate anymore. The 3,000-year-old paternity test has identified Tut's dad, Akhenaten. But that's only one half of the puzzle. The real mystery is who his mum was. No one's been able to identify her from records. But a clue to who she was lies deep inside a place that not many people get to see. A real royalty. Watch your head. It's one of the most lavish tombs in Egypt. Carry on down? Yeah, we keep going down and down and down. There it is. There's the room. This is what a king is supposed to have. That's wild. The tomb belonged to Amenhotep II, and it's a world away from the basic adornments found in Tut's tomb. When it was discovered, did they actually find the king himself? Yeah. Yes, he was in his own sarcophagus right there, which is pretty wonderful. It's amazing, isn't it? Look at that. But the real find here was the discovery of an extraordinary group of royal mummies all thought to be linked to Tut's father, Akhenaten. There were three bodies on the floor. Yeah. Uh, a person they call the elder lady, a young boy, and a very mysterious younger lady. And have we any idea who the younger lady is? For a long time we had no idea, but now the suspicion is that she's King Tut's mum. The 
This younger lady is a truly mysterious person. There are no hieroglyphs to explain who she was, but we do have her DNA. Okay, okay. This time, as well as genetic fingerprinting, Albert is testing mitochondrial DNA. Just put the gel in the fridge. It's only inherited from the mother. It's very good. It's very clean. Together, they can prove conclusively and for the first time who Tut's mum was. To reveal the results, we're going to the famous Egyptian museum in Cairo to meet the younger lady face to face. So here we are. Here we are. Gosh, she's in pretty bad shape. But maybe it's because she had a big injury in the face here. And the pattern of the injury is typical for a horse kick. Oh, oh gosh, so this, this, that, that damage was actually done when she was still alive. So... Yeah, yeah. I think it's actually the cause of death because there's no signs of healing. So, so what do we know about this mummy and what, what work have you been able to do on it? We did some CT scans of this mummy. We found out she had a little extra single bone on the back of her skull and the sutures, which is quite uncommon. But the same little bone we found in King Tut also. And this was really surprising. And this made us believe, oh, maybe there's a link between this. And then you do the DNA work. Now, what did you find with the DNA work? We took samples from this mummy, did the DNA analysis. So I was sitting in front of my computer late at night in the laboratory, looking at the data, a lot of numbers. Slowly, the picture comes together, and I, I aligned all the different numbers, and I saw, well, they all look the same. King Tut, younger lady, wow. Oh, my God, that's it. They, this is the mother of King Tut. I can't believe it. It was like, I was shocked. I, said, I cannot believe it. This is true. We really found out who is the mother of King Tut. I mean, that's, that's a huge discovery. This is really a, more than a dream come true. I think it's the most important findings I made in my life. Alberts identified the younger lady definitively as Tut's genetic mother. We're finally getting closer to Tutankhamun and his relatives, catching glimpses of them not as great rulers or gods, but as a family. This is the tomb that was probably meant for the younger lady. Have a look at this. This is a, an image that's really intrigued people since this tomb was discovered. You can see it's, a, it's not very clear, but it's a woman in profile. You can just see there's her feet there up to her head, and she seems to be holding an umbrella or a parasol of some kind, and there's a, perhaps a nurse behind her looking after her. And she seems to be holding a figure, a baby. Could that be the very first baby picture of Tut? The DNA results identified the members of Tut's family but they also uncovered something completely unexpected about his parents. When he compared the DNA of Tut's father, Akhenaten, with the DNA of Tut's mother, Albert made a remarkable discovery. And you know, there's some more I can tell you about these two mummies. It's not only that this is the father and this is the mother of King Tut. They it turned out that they are brother and sister, which was a big surprise for us. So, so Tut's mother and father, so their mother and father, they were also brother and sister. So Tut was a product of incest. That's right. I mean, it turned out, wow, yeah. they're brother and sister. A lot of incest happened 
they didn't like to get royal and non-royal blood mixed, so they tried to keep it within the royal family. The ancient Egyptians believed incest kept the bloodline pure. In reality, of course, it did the opposite. They would have had no idea about the, 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 the health implications of, of incest. We know that this can have a negative impact on your health, and it caused a lot of troubles in the health of the offspring. The DNA tests proved that Tut's parents were brother and sister. Tutankhamun was a product of incest. So, meet the parents. This uh, is Tutankhamun's dad, Akhenaten. And if we come this way, next to dad, we've got Tutankhamun's granny. Who looks the best out of all of them, actually. And here, we've got Tutankhamun's mum, who's also his aunt, which makes dad also his uncles, because they were brother and sister as well. fascinating picture is starting to develop. A sudden death and burial. An unusual and life-threatening fracture to his knee. A disabled foot from a disease which may have run in the family. And incest which dramatically increases the chance of inheriting certain diseases. And now there's one man who thinks he's pieced together all of these clues. OK, so I'll be really careful coming in here. There's a big hole. Oh, and the light. Dr. Hutan Ashrafian is a leading surgeon who specialises in cold cases from the ancient past. Oh, this is great. Here you go. Look at this. this is the best view of Karnak. From this vantage point, we can see the whole of Karnak beneath us. It's the biggest temple in ancient Egypt, built by generations of pharaohs, including Tut and his ancestors. By studying the entire family history, Hutan's noticed three distinct medical patterns that could help explain how Tut died. The family are very interesting in that they all died relatively young. We know that Akhenaten died early. We know that Tutankhamun, his son, died early. We know that the great-grandfather died relatively early. They died at a sequentially younger age. But couldn't that just be due to other causes that, you know, by chance they all died at particularly young age for, for, for a whole host of reasons? Of course, certainly it could be, but there is a pattern there and it would be unfair for us to discount that. The fact that each generation died younger than the previous one could be an indication that there's an inherited disease running through the family. But what was it? There are clues in some of the artwork of the period. So this is Tut's dad, we think. So this is the, the statue of Akhenaten. Let's have a look at him. And, you know, clearly this is a not, not a male form. I mean, it does look very feminine, wider hips. This is meant to be a pharaoh, but he doesn't look like a normal man. Looked through a medical doctor's eyes, this is not just a statue, it's a symptom. But are we just seeing an exaggerated, stylistic, symbolic art style? It could be, 
but actually we know that Akhenaten himself during his lifetime asked for things to be depicted according to real life. Yeah. And so if we take that on board, then clearly this figure is abnormal. These feminized features like wider hips and enhanced breasts suggest some kind of hormone imbalance, and they appear throughout the generations, including Tut himself. It's a hormonal condition which can be passed down through the genes that will cause them to look like a woman. Again, this unusual condition seems to run in the family, but what might cause it? To narrow it down, Hutan's identified another pattern. And evidence of what it is can be found here, in one of the most famous sites in ancient Egypt. I wonder how many photographs have been taken of that view. Tourists have been coming here for millennia just to marvel at the scale of it all. Empires have come, empires have gone, and the Sphinx has witnessed it all. The final clue to this family condition lies in an unlikely place between the giant paws of the Sphinx With me is Egyptologist Yasmin El Shazli. Gosh, I've never been this close to it. Yes, it's Hi, beautiful. Sphinx. Isn't it? It's amazing. This stone tablet is known as the dream stealer of Tutmosis IV, who was Tut's great grandfather. And it tells the story of a strange hallucination. It says Tutmosis IV was uh, on a um, hunting trip, and then he decided to take a rest, and he fell asleep, and uh, he had a vision. Back then, the Sphinx was covered in sand up to its neck. The Sphinx was telling him, please, if you remove the sand from my body, I will make you king. Right. Tutmosis IV removed the sand from the body of the Sphinx and cleaned the Sphinx and became king. It could simply be a symbolic political statement. But if literally true, it suggests that Tut's great-grandfather had a powerful vision. Akhenaten, Tutankhamun's father, is also recorded as having similar religious visions. This family pattern is the final clue. Bhutan now believes he knows what killed Tutankhamun. It's an illness that can be inherited, that causes early death, affects hormone levels, and crucially, triggers visions. It can even explain the fracture in Tut's knee. Adding together everything that happened in his life and his whole family line, if we add all of that together and we say, what could describe this condition? And we have now the tangible evidence from the body with a fracture. The only thing that adds all those things up at the moment is that he might have had temporal lobe epilepsy. It is a controversial diagnosis, but it does seem to make sense of a lot of the symptoms. Epilepsy affects the brain, causing hallucinations. It can interfere with hormone production. 
and the seizures themselves can lead to unexpected fractures. We have to think about Tutankhamun as someone who's epileptic, but without treatment. And without treatment, you have a much higher risk of having unexpected right. falls, unexpected accidents, and unexpected fractures as a result. So let me be clear, it's not the epilepsy itself that would have killed him, it's the epilepsy that could have led to a fracture, which would then have... Absolutely, so the killed him. epilepsy would lead to the fracture, and the fracture would have all sorts of complications, like right. bleeding and infection, and that's probably what killed Tutankhamun. It is a radical new solution to this 3,000-year-old mystery. An illness passed on to him from earlier generations and made worse by being the product of incest. At the age of 19, the body of Tutankhamun was put into a tomb in the Valley of the Kings. where he remained undiscovered for 3,000 years, forgotten by history. But in death, he achieved the goal of every pharaoh. To cross the vast ocean of time and keep his name alive. To achieve immortality. This is much more than just the most famous treasure ever discovered. It's more than just a mask. The mask is Tutankhamun. When people look at it, they say his name.